All right, today is March 3rd, 2018 on the calendar here in the United States and on the Hebrew calendar. Sheish Esrei Be'adar, Chamashim V'Sheva, Shevi'im V'Shmone, or the 16th of Adar, 5778. We're continuing <coughs> in our messages on the Didache. And this week is Grace After Meals. It's... We're dealing with chapter 10 of I just dropped out completely. I did put a different battery in. Do you need me to change it again? Yes, no. Keep going. I would try a new battery. Oh, try a new battery. Okay. We'll give that a try. So if you have, we're, for those of you who are visiting, I've been teaching uh, on the DDK out of this book uh, called The Way of Life, The Rediscovered Teachings of the Twelve Jewish Apostles to the Gentiles. If you're not familiar with the DDK, uh, it is a document that um, at least was highly influenced by the twelve apostles if not pinned by them and it was the answer um, to the Gentiles that were coming into faith and coming into fellowship with the uh, the Jews that believed in Yeshua um, the Time of the writing is believed to be 50 CE, so this is actually prior, this was uh, compiled prior to the destruction of the temple. Um, and it is, it's just, it's an instruction manual, so to speak, uh, to the Gentiles to tell them how that they are supposed to live out the Torah amongst Jews. Okay, and so we're going through this. It's a very valuable book. Um, this was the Apostles' interpretation of what the Scripture says and how it applies to specifically to Gentiles. And so, because we're using this book today, if you've got the book, several people in the congregation do have the book, if you'll turn to page 365, this is where chapter 10 of the DDK begins. And here's what, the, what chapter 10 has to say. It says, After you have been satisfied, give thanks in this way. We thank you, our Holy Father, for your holy name that you have caused to dwell in our hearts and for the knowledge, faithfulness, and eternal life that you have made known to us through your servant, Yeshua. Yours is the glory forever. You, O Lord of legions, created all things for the sake of your name. You gave nourishment and drink for human beings to enjoy in order that they would give thanks to you. You also bestowed upon us spiritual nourishment and drink and eternal life through your servant. And for all things we thank you because you are powerful Yours is the glory forever. Remember, O Lord, your congregation to rescue her from all evil and to make her complete in your love. Gather her, the sanctified, from the four winds to your kingdom that you have prepared for her. For yours is the power and the glory forever. May grace come and may this world pass away. Hoshana to the God of David. Everyone who is holy, let him come. Everyone who is not, 
let him repent. Maran Atah. Amen. Permit the prophets to lead the giving of thanks as much as they desire. I want, I want us to actually begin by going to Devarim chapter 8. Devarim chapter 8. It's if you've got the complete Jewish Bible, it's page 206 in the complete Jewish Bible. Devarim Deuteronomy chapter 8. Hmm? Uh, the whole thing. Devarim 8 is not tremendously long. And it has it has the entire chapter is about giving thanks to God uh, for what He has provided. So, beginning with verse 1, All the mitzvot I am giving you today you are to take care to obey so that you will live, increase your numbers, enter and take possession of the land Adonai swore about to your ancestors. You are to remember everything of the way in which Adonai led you these 40 years in the desert, humbling and testing you in order to know what was in your heart, whether you would obey his mitzvot or not. He humbled you, allowing you to become hungry, and then fed you with man, which neither you nor your ancestors had ever known, to make you understand that a person does not live on food alone, but on everything that comes from the mouth of Adonai. During these 40 years, the clothing you were wearing didn't grow old and your feet didn't swell up. Think deeply about it. Adonai was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his child. So obey the mitzvot of Adonai your God, living as he directs and fearing him. For Adonai your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams, springs and water welling up from the depths in valleys and on hillsides. It is a land of wheat and barley, grapevines, fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food in abundance and lack nothing in it, a land where the stones contain iron and the hills can be mined for copper. So you will eat and be satisfied and you will bless Adonai your God for the good land He has given you. Be careful not to forget Adonai your God by not obeying His mitzvot, rulings and regulations that I am giving you today. Otherwise, after you have eaten and are satisfied, built fine houses and lived in them, and increased your herds, flocks, silver, gold, and everything else you own, you will become proud-hearted, forgetting Adonai your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt where you lived as slaves, who led you through the vast and fearsome desert with its poisonous snakes, scorpions, and waterless thirsty ground, who brought water out of a flint rock for you, who fed you in the desert with man, unknown to your ancestors, all the while humbling and testing you in order to do you good in the end. You will think to yourself, my own power and the strength of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. This is what we were talking about mm -hmm. with the Torah portion commentary as well. Yep. No, you are to remember Adonai your God because it is He who is giving you the power to get wealth in order to confirm His covenant which He swore to your ancestors as it is happening even today. If you forget Adonai your God, follow other gods and serve and worship them, I am warning you in advance today that you will certainly perish. You will perish just like the nations that Adonai is causing to perish ahead of you because you will not have heeded the voice of Adonai your God. And so I, we need to now you know, take a look at what is and as I, as I told you um, when we started back into 
the DDK, after being, after taking a break from it for a period of time, that the DDK sees itself as taking what the scripture already says and just expounding and, and teaching and telling this is how you put into practice what this uh, has, has what God has already said in the Torah. So even, even if, you know, we were just reading in chapter 10, after you have been satisfied, you know, chapter 9 was about giving thanks prior to eating. Now this is giving thanks after having eaten. So after you've been satisfied, give thanks in this way, and then they lay out some prayers um, to pray. They see this as, uh, as instructing in how to carry out what God has said in this chapter in Devilim that we just read. Okay. So again, like the prayer prior to the prayers prior to eating this as well is not about a eucharist meal this is about actually when you gather together to eat as a community with one another okay so this contains blessings that thank god for the physical and spiritual nourishment enjoyed at fellowship meals among believers. The DDK's prayers were created so that Gentile believers could fulfill the commandment of saying grace after the meals. Now what I, what I want to really stress to you, if you've got the book and you're following along in the book, is what it says in the ne under the next category, the first paragraph there says, although the injunction to bless God before eating food is derived from a rabbinic tradition, the commandment to bless after the meal is based upon a scriptural injunction. It is derived from this passage in Deuteronomy ch chapter 8, verse 10, where God tells the Jewish people, you shall eat and be full and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. When one finishes eating and is satiated, he is required to bless the Creator. Reciting a thanksgiving prayer after a meal is the customary way to fulfill the obligation. The traditional prayer is called the Birchat Hamazon. I told you about that the last time. Birchat Hamazon, which literally means the blessing for food. We will simply refer to it henceforth in this book, anyway, as the grace after the meal. Now, one of the things that they talk about in this particular book is um, this particular prayer that is brought forth here. Um, well, the one that, that is normally said which is not from this book, the one that's normally said, Birchat Hamazon, has four sections. But in the days of the apostles, there was only three sections to it. And one of the things that they talk about in this book is that this was not, this is not like the Messianic version to replace the Rabbinic version. And in fact, the, the method that they employ in this particular pr uh, set of prayers, it's suspected that it's actually based upon the prayers that predate what we currently have today. What has been developed as Birchat Hamazon is actually believed to have come later, after the destruction of the temple. So. This particular prayer that we see in chapter 10 is actually closer to the original prayer after the meal than what the rabbinic Jews use. Okay? Now there's a lot of 
there's a lot of commonality. If, in fact, this actually has a chart in it where it compares the concepts between what the DDK says and what the uh, modern day Birkat Hamazon has in it. And obviously the language is very, very similar between the two. Now one of the things that people would say is, well, I don't know that we have to do it because we don't ever see either Yeshua, there's not anything in the, in the Brit HaKadoshah in the New Covenant Scriptures that show Yeshua or the Apostles ever doing this. Okay? But here's what they have to say. The Gospels never explicitly mention the Master praying grace after meals. But there's absolutely no reason to suppose that He did not. After He fed both the 4,000 and the 5,000, the Synoptic Gospel narratives state, and listen to the wording, okay, the wording is really important. They all ate and were, sati and were satisfied. So, by using this wording, it is a direct connection to Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10. You shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God. This citation in the Gospels is an indication that the Master and His disciples recited grace after meals. Okay, so even though it's not explicitly there, uh, you know, one of the things that we need to remember at all times, which is not so many of the folks in this congregation especially have come from pre previously from Christian backgrounds where you didn't even discuss or think about anything Jewish at all. So much of what you are learning and have learned over the years is has been new uh, to your experience. What we need to always remember when we read in the Gospels about Yeshua, we need to remember that He was a Jew in every sense of the word. And yes, there were some things that He did not agree with. Um, for instance, there were ideas about work on the Shabbat, they, these, these ideas were debated at the time. Okay, For instance, when he got in trouble for, the, for his Talmudim, his disciples stripping grain on the Shabbat. See, those, those things where they challenged Yeshua about him either him doing work, healing or whatever, doing work or allowing his Talmudim to do work on the Shabbat, those were contested items. Those were not things that were, had been established where a person could say, see it says right here, you can't do that. Okay. The canonization and the standardization of rulings actually I mean it was obviously there was some of that already established by the time Yeshua came but the bulk of that where they standardize across the board came much later after Yeshua okay so the idea of of him violating the Shabbat Yeshua never violated any command of the Father. And therefore, those things which had been established by the time that He came on the scene, where the sages of Israel had said, this is the way that we carry out what God has set forth in the Torah, Yeshua did those things, unless it was something that was in conflict in His heart and mind, and who is he? He's God in the flesh. If, they, if, if what they had ruled was in conflict with what he believed had been set forth by the Father, then 
he wouldn't do it like they did it. But otherwise, he did everything that was set forth for Jewish people to do. And so, if everyone else did the blessings after the meal, Yeshua did the blessings after the meal. And it is, it is, there is an injunction implied in the scripture in chapter, in Devarim 8.10, to give thanks after you eat, after you've been satisfied. This goes on to say, make a very strong statement, which, you know, I agree with. Birchat Hamazon is not something that I have done in my life. And I think I, I think I need to change that. And in fact, today, after we have eaten, I want to declare this prayer, these prayers from chapter 10 of the DDK. Because it says on page 369, if you're following along, the last paragraph there right before the, the section, the grace after meals on the DDK, it says, when we fail to give the Father thanks in times of plenty, we begin to think that provision comes from our own strength. We forget that we depend upon His daily provision. It is easy to remember God when we experience times of need, but when things are going well, it is crucial for us to stay focused on Him so that we do not get haughty. Ingratitude turns us away from Him and we wander into sin. And so, uh, I think it's actually very important for us to, to do this. Again, if you're following along, if you'll turn the page over to page 371, there are some things that I want to point out. So the, the book talks about the striking parallels between uh, the traditional Birchat Hamazon and the prayers in the Didache. Um, it says, the rabbinic requirement to mention the land of Israel, the covenant that God made with the Jewish people, and the Torah in the grace after meals does not influence the Didache's version. And one reason for the omission of these elements may be that the version in the Didache reflects a much earlier form of grace after meals that predates those rabbinic forms. And that's what I was talking about earlier. The rabbinic forms actually were developed later. Like other elements of Jewish liturgy, the grace after meals with which we are familiar probably received its current form in the generations following the destruction of the temple. Alternatively, the absence of those specific elements which are decidedly Jewish themes might indicate that this prayer was constructed specifically for Gentile believers. And that's another important point to bring out. Non-Jewish disciples of the Master do not have the same relationship with the land, the covenant, and the Torah that the Jewish people do. And so, being that the DDK is formulated for Gentiles, um, it, there might be that uh, going on as well. Now, down at the bottom it says, it must be remembered that the wording of Jewish liturgy was not as fixed in the first century as it is today. And that's where I was talking about the standardization. Okay. The last, from this, this beginning commentary, the last thing that I want to point out would be found on page 374 in the book. It says here, several options exist for those attempting to implement the DDK's prayers at mealtime. Some may wish to recite the post-meal prayers of the DDK as they stand. Others who may perhaps be those among a mixed group of Messianic Jews and Gentiles might want to integrate the DDK version throughout the traditional Birchat Hamazon, Grace After Meals, reciting the two together. Some Gentile believers may wish to recite the first blessing of the traditional grace after meals, as many modern Jewish authorities recommend, while others might prefer to do so in combination with the DDK's prayers. So, there's a lot of freedom in how 
that this, these prayers can be implemented. But the fact remains that we need to be thanking the Lord after we've been satisfied. Now I want us to go to into where they break down uh, the phrases in the, um, the verses. On page 376, um, there's a, the last paragraph on 376 says, Name, or Shem, in this context refers to the dwelling presence or Holy Spirit of God this is talking about, um, we thank you, our Holy Father, for your holy name that you have caused to dwell in our hearts, from, taken from DDK chapter 10, verse 2. So name, in this context, refers to the dwelling presence or the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? Known in rabbinic writings as the Shekhinah. The scriptures speak of Jerusalem and in particular the temple as the place where God chose to cause His name to dwell. The Talmud mentions that the watchmen in the temple greeted one another on the Shabbat by saying, May he who caused his name to dwell in this house cause love, brotherhood, peace, and friendship to dwell among you. In the DDK's prayers, God's name equates to His dwelling presence. Now, there, and I, I think they get to it here in a little bit. So I'll just go on. According to the DDK, God's dwelling presence will also rest on believers in Messiah. This is important because in Jewish thought, the Holy Spirit could not rest on Gentiles unless they formally converted to Judaism. The apostles spoke of all believers, both Jewish and Gentiles, as the temple of the Holy Spirit, where God's presence dwelled within them. The book of the Revelation states, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Okay, Not just the Jews, but man. This concept does not replace the presence of God in the temple when it stands, but instead was understood by some rabbis as the complementary interpretation of Exodus 25.8 that says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, in which the Hebrew for in their midst, Betocham, can be interpreted as in them. Okay? The version of this blessing in the apostolic constitutions seems to allude to this Exodus passage by changing dwell in our hearts to dwell among us. The indwelling of the Shekhinah finds its ultimate manifestation in Messiah, which we already mentioned. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's from Yohanan, John 1.14. While we have a measure of the Lord's Spirit within us, in Colossians 1.19 it says, In Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Just as the knowledge, faithfulness, and eternal life is made known through Yeshua, so is the Lord's holy name. Again, a quote from Yohanan 17.26. John 17.26, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So the dwelling presence of God rests specifically in the heart, in Hebrew, lev, which in Judaism is the figurative source of one's will and decision-making capabilities. That means that this indwelling of the Holy Father is to be reduced not, excuse me, not to be reduced to a pious fiction or to sentimental feelings. Holiness for the framers of the DDK was firmly attached to knowing the way of life revealed by the Father and putting it into practice. For these newly immersed Gentile initiates, the indwelling of God's name symbolized the conferring of a new identity and a new kin, speaking the name 
has the power to effect the transformation of the Gentile believer into a member of the renewed kingdom to receive the holy name was, was to be received into the commonwealth of Israel. And so from here, now in the book, they proceed on because with this whole idea of doing and not just, not just it being some ethereal concept, but actually putting into practice, because the next line in DDK chapter 10, verse 2, and it says, And for the knowledge, faithfulness, and eternal life that you have made known to us through your servant Yeshua, yours is the glory forever. Those who attend here on a regular basis know I put a lot of emphasis on faithfulness. Because the scripture is very, very clear to us that it is those who endure to the end that will be saved. Those are the specific words in the scripture. Yeshua said the person who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not worthy of the kingdom. So faithfulness is something that is very, very important it is absolutely crucial to God. And so in the DDK, they could have just said, and for the knowledge and eternal life, but they didn't. They stuck faithfulness in there as well. Now they're talking about the faithfulness at this point in the, in the prayer, the faithfulness of Yeshua, but we're told we're to emulate our Messiah. We're to emulate Yeshua. We are to be Faithful like He is faithful. And so, in the, in the second paragraph on page 378, underneath this part of the DK, chapter 10, verse 2, it says, Faithfulness in Hebrew is the word emunah. We've already, I've done a teaching on this. In Hebrew, faith and faithfulness are the same word. Yep. There's, not any, there's not two words like we have in, in English. Okay? One word encompasses both concepts. It says, and refers not just to belief, but to trust, loyalty, and steadfastness that is carried out in action. As Yaakov, James, the brother of the Master, said, Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. That's Yaakov, James chapter 2, verse 17. We show our faith through our works. After all, we were justified by the faithfulness of the Messiah, and it is our duty as disciples to follow in the example of His obedience. In that way, we received faithfulness, in other words, they go on to say, we receive faithfulness as a gift through God's servant, Yeshua. Okay. You know, all of the gifts that we are given by God, the only way, just like anything else, that, that we may be gifted in, in order to develop that gift and to be able to use that gift the way that we're supposed to, it means that we have to actually have to employ the gift. So when it comes to faithfulness, we have to do faithfulness to be to increase the faithfulness in us. We can't just talk about it being in us as a conceptual thing and not actually put it into practice. So faithfulness is some it's a gift, but we have to use it. Page 381 the top paragraph there. These are things that I wanted to... Now, if you want to study all of this out in detail, you can get the book. But these are things that I wanted to bring out of here that I thought were especially important. Contrary to many ascetic beliefs... God desires that we enjoy the nourishment that He gives to us. 
the Apostle Paul enjoins us not to be haughty in our material gains, for it is God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. The Jerusalem Talmud even contains the opinion that, quote, in the future a man is going to have to give an account for everything, and as in brackets it says permissible pleasure, that his eye saw and he did not eat. Kedushin 4.12 Now, I'll just stop right there. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but the concept is there that God provided things for us to bless us and to, for us to enjoy. And if we go through life always negative and never seeing the blessings, never acknowledging the blessings that God has given to us, then we're, at, we're in sin. Because God gave to us things specifically to bless us and for us to enjoy. We need to acknowledge that. We need to take advantage of those things which He has given to us to enjoy. To not do so would be, and, and this is where the concept comes from that, that he'll have to give an account. This would be like a child whose parents give that child a gift. But the child's attitude and reaction to that gift is, I don't want that. How does, how does that make a parent feel? when they give their gift, give a gift to their child. But the child says, I don't want that. Okay? That it, it is a slight towards the parent. Well, when we do that with what God has given, we're doing that to God. Okay? In Jewish tradition, Shabbat meal gatherings are called oneg, which, by the way, oneg means delight. And so when we get together to eat, we are delighting in what has been provided. And in them, delicious food and drink are served to increase the level of celebration and enjoyment. Ultimately, this matter of e manner of eating is not about gluttony or hedonism, but instead is meant to result in our giving thanks and praise to our Father in heaven for all that He has created and given us to enjoy. And then flip over to page 383. The last paragraph before, Remember, O Lord, your congregation. In several of the DDK's doxologies, power is attributed to the Lord. And in chapter 16, it is said that the earth will be delivered into His power. In rabbinic literature and in the Targums, one of the names for God is the power, which is in Hebrew, Hagevorah. Yeshua uses the title in his trial before the high priest Caiaphas. He says, I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at Hagevorah, or at the right hand of Hagevorah, the right hand of power. God is also described as powerful in the second benediction, which is called Gevogah of the Amidah. This benediction is largely centered on the resurrection of the dead, which fits into the DDK's reference to eternal life. These doxologies are absent from the version of the post-meal prayers in the Apostolic Constitutions. Page 384. And I've got a star by this because this I want to really emphasize. Prior to this, the last paragraph on page 384, it's been talking about Ecclesia, what Ecclesia means, um, as to how it's translated into congregation um, in the DDK instead of assembly. Um, and then it uh, juxtaposes that against the other Hebrew words, edah, 
and kahal in Hebrew. Um, then the next paragraph says, like the Our Fathers rescue us from what is evil, this third blessing of the DDK's grace after meals petitions God to rescue His people from all evil and to bring relief from trouble, troubles. So then we go down to the last paragraph. Once the congregation is rescued, they will be complete in God's love. Complete, the Greek word teleos, appears three other times in the DDK and has the sense of unblemished or perfect. This is reminiscent of the Master's prayer, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. The Apostle John writes, Whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in Him. No one has ever seen God. Seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. These are all quotes from John, either the Gospel or one of his books, other books. In the final redemption, we will be complete and fulfilled in God's love in perfect unity with one another. What I wanted to bring up on this is when Yeshua gave that prayer, I don't think that He was, um, I don't think that He had the idea that we would all be able to be perfect in unity while living this life. I think that prayer was mostly towards the ultimate fulfillment of the unity that will be brought when Messiah Yeshua returns. Okay? However, the very fact that, that He says, that Yeshua says, so that the world may know that You sent Me and loved them even as You loved Me, obviously for that to happen, that has to occur now. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's not for a future time. Mm -hmm. In order for the world to know now, there has to be the unity now. Now, I think Yeshua understands and knows that we're not going to always get that right. That there's going to be disunity from time to time. People are going to disagree with one another. One of the things I want to say is disagreeing with one another does not equal disunity. Okay? That is very, very important for us to understand. Just because you disagree on a particular issue with someone doesn't mean that you can't be unified with them. That you, that you have to separate yourself from them. Okay? So, being able to maintain unity in the face of disagreement is actually a very, very important thing for the disciples of Yeshua. And, and it's something that we all, every single one of us, need to work on. Because Yeshua says that it's through that unity that the world will understand uh, that who we are and who we belong to and who He is. And so it's very, that is a very important and I wanted to really emphasize that. Page 385 uh, is referring to chapter 10 verse 5 where, this, where it says, Gather her, the sanctified from the four winds, to your kingdom that you have prepared for her, for yours is the power and the glory forever. In this prayer, sanctified is related to the Hebrew term mekedoshet, which is used in the context of marriage to mean betrothed, which is very interesting. In a Jewish wedding, when a ring is placed on the bride's hand, the groom says, Behold, 
you are sanctified to me by means of this ring. Therefore, the DDK alludes to the bride of the Messiah. The Master tells us that he consecrates himself and sanctifies or betrothes us in truth. Paul states, I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Messiah in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. So I thought that was very, very interesting. Gather her, the sanctified or the betrothed. You should, normally when we see the sanctified, that's not what we think of. We're not thinking of the betrothed. We're thinking of somebody who has been set apart and made holy spiritually. But this is talking about God is saying, I have betrothed you to me. You're, you're my bride. And then a couple other things that I just want to touch on. <clears throat> on page 387, having to do with the whole idea of, of glory to God and the petition for grace to come. This is something in the last paragraph on 387, this is something that I have been trying to wrap my head around for actually some years. And it has to do with uh, where people will say Hosanna in the highest or whatever. Understanding that the word Hoshana is actually an Aramaic word which is shortened from Hebrew that is transliterated into Greek in the DDK. It appears in Psalm 118.25 where it says, Save us. So, Hoshiana, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. And it is found frequently in the Hashanot liturgy for Sukkot. Now here's what we need to understand, and this is what I want to share with you so that you understand. Because knowing the Hebrew, I, I have known that Hoshana or Hoshiana was a call for God to rescue. Okay? And so I never could really understand why would you say Hosanna to God in the highest? Why would you say rescue us to God in the highest? That didn't make any sense to me. Well, originally it was used as a cry for help. But eventually it became an expression of praise and even a salutation. Hoshana to the God of David finds its parallel in the Gospels in Hoshana to the Son of David. As Yeshua entered Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the crowds greeted him with Hoshana to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That's from Matthew 21, 9. Hoshana to the son of David functioned as a petition and a greeting among the early Jewish believers. So the reason they employed that was because it eventually became um, a praise and a salutation. But its originally, original meaning was a cry for help. Now in the case of, of Yeshua coming into Jerusalem, that was fitting in both ways. Um, because there is a cry for, for God to help. And Messiah was the answer to that cry for help. And then I want to finish up with the last, last couple pages there, 390 and 391. Permit the prophets to lead the giving of thanks as much as they desire. Just to give some understanding of what that particular verse means. Let the prophets, emissaries, and teachers of the DDK, the Levitical priests, or excuse me, like the prophets, emissaries, and teachers of the DDK, the Levitical priests continue to hold a special place of honor in the Jewish community even today. When the Torah is read in the synagogue, 
descendants of the priesthood are always given the opportunity to read first. And on special days, they still recite the Aaronic benediction over the congregation. Additionally, at a meal at which grace after meals is recited, a priest or Kohen is honored by being permitted to lead the prayer. However, if a Torah scholar is present, he might be given the honor in the place of the priest. In the same way, it seems that when a prophet, emissary, or teacher, like the priest or Torah scholar, was present at a meal of the early believers, he would have been offered the privilege of leading the post-meal prayer. In this way, the community honored prophets, emissaries, and teachers at their meals. And so this was actually seen as a means whereby you honor someone if you ask them to be the one to do the birkat hamazon after the meal, then um, that was actually a show of honor. And so, if <laughs> I know that gr growing up in my in my house that I grew up in, if you were asked to pray, it was like. Oh, do I have to? I don't know if you, if anybody else grew up like that, but it's that you know I don't have that. When I was a kid, I felt like that, but now I don't. But but uh, no, it's actually a great honor to be asked to to bless the Lord um, on behalf of the people, and so if you're ever asked to do that. Um, see that as a great honor uh, to the Lord. Obviously, uh, next time we're together, we will take a look at chapter 11. I think, I think that completes um, the issue of blessing over the food. And we move on to other topics. Now, the, in chapter 11, it talks about... Um, emissaries and prophets and so on. So it's kind of a good segue there at the end of chapter 10 um, to talk about uh, those per particular offices. Yes, sir. Whenever the uh, Hosanna and the highest know that uh, Yeshua, whenever he was addressing the uh, religiously, he said that God had perfected Pray. And those yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's pray. Father, you know, after a little while, we will actually have physical food. But Lord, we thank you for the spiritual food that you give to us as well. Father, thank you for the instructions that we have in the DDK from, from the apostles, the men who lived life with you for several years, whom you taught, um, who learned from the best. So Father, may we um, heed what these men had to say to us, even if it's in a book that was not included in the Bible. It's very important instructions for those who are non-Jewish in how to live out what the Scripture says. So, Father, may we all be blessed um, very, in very practical terms by what we are reading and studying uh, about this particular book, the DDK. And Father, we do want to give you thanks. We want to acknowledge at all times and have a grateful heart at all times that you are the source. Everything that we need, everything that we have that is good. Lord, we thank you for giving to us all that we have. In Yeshua's name, Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevaret Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav alecha v'yikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.